I think a shift is needed because I think women have to force themselves into those environments. You know, again, fight for their place. I think an invitation and in, an invitation from the institutions where they're welcoming and making the environments and the studies. I know of one course that eradicated, and one engineering course that eradicated mathematics as a subject so that they could get more women into. Not that the women weren't smart or intelligent, but it was so focused on the mathematics that they said, let, you know, come into the course and then we'll train you and help you and develop you in the mathematics side. So I think it's got to be an invitation and looking at the current curriculums in academia that is it invitational? For example, you know, can, can you invite me to sit at your table and I feel welcomed and the structures and, and systems will support me um, as a woman when I come in? And I think that more conversations and dialogue needs to be had about the change in curriculum, but also I see that in corporate. Women don't want, after they've, many women leave corporates after they've had a child because their value system changes. And they say, I don't want to compete anymore. I don't want to drive myself and toughen up and boot it up and tough it out. And I think that's why I speak about grace and resilience because we're going to need environments and companies that welcome these qualities, not reject them. And that doesn't mean we're soft and fluffy, that means we are resilient and strong, but they recognise our humanity as well as profit. The Flourish Initiative is a company that I formulated four years ago, and it's a consulting business with a team of my colleagues, and we work from the basis that well-being is the foundation of performance. So we go into organisations and we teach and um, encourage leaders to work with these qualities of working on the human resources that they have in their environment and in their people, which are physical and mental, emotional and spiritual. They're the resources we have in here. So until those systems internally are operating at their full potential, we don't flourish and we don't perform. So in my talk I was speaking about the statistics on absenteeism and that's mental health, mental ill health. And companies, some companies I know of, the insurance companies now won't insure them because their absenteeism statistics are so high and they're not managing the well-being of their people. And leaders, sadly, many leaders don't actually care, genuinely care about their people. So that's what we, we work with organisations where leaders want to have their business prosper and their people flourish and the two can work. And that's what I did with my aromatherapy company. Now it was based on essential oils and it was based on you know, healing, but all of my staff were included as a community. We, and it would now be called what is now referred to as conscious leadership, but that was back in the 80s. We would do meditation, we would practice mindfulness, we would make the doctors and the naysayers that were ridiculing our business, we would include them. We ended up working in hospitals with nurses, we worked in drug rehabilitation clinics. So we literally, penetrated the system with grace. We bought these, these precious oils. I still use, I don't, it's not my company anymore, which was sold in 99, but I still use them every day. You know, I had oils on my hand as I was walking into the presentation. You know, I, they're my part of my resilience because they're mother's nature's, mother nature's gifts. And we can use them beautifully for, for everyday use, for our healing and for our own resilience. And I'm sure that's why I've come through many of the things I've come through, because I use them every day. I grew up in the country and um, I think I was very much attuned to the feeling of freedom and the feeling of joy that I had from being in nature and um, having those beautiful natural country smells. And as I, um, as I got older, I was partying really hard in my teen late teenage years. And I woke up one day and it was an, an epiphanal moment saying, there's got to be more to life than this. And so I went and trained as an aerobic instructor and then I trained in natural health and I trained in nutrition. But I fell in love with aromatherapy because one, it was centuries old. Cleopatra would anoint her body and there were many beautiful stories about the traditions of essential oils. But now science backs it. 
So I had the lovely contrast for myself of the stories and the myths and the tradition and the herbal folklore and now the chemical analysis of essential oils of how effective they are for the immune system, for the body. And what's beautiful when you put those two together is the sensuality. So when you massage, I taught thousands of women to massage their bodies every day and they would honour this body, you know, and they would honour themselves before they got dressed. And women, you know, women have got a thing. It's well known that not a lot of women love their bodies. But the women that we taught were like, I love my body. And that was just such a joy to see women really just love themselves and, and be sensual. And, and, and that's not sexual. That's just sens having sens sensuality and being sensory aware. So I think that's the gift it's given me, is being much more tuned to my senses. So in space or place, when we can smell, you know, we, we say something doesn't smell right here, or something smells fishy about this. Our sense of smell is actually the organ of intuition. It indicates many things to us. And scientists actually, research that I've done in, in terms of the sense of smell, scientists actually say that the sense of smell is more responsible for our sense of attraction to another person than the physical attraction because we can never be with someone we don't like the smell of. It's very interesting. It's a very good detector. <laughs>